Bon, Despina va vous introduire les différents protagonistes. Je vous informe juste que cette conversation sera entièrement en anglais et que des casques de traduction sont à votre disposition à l'entrée de la nef. Donc n'hésitez pas. Bonjour. Hello everyone. Hello. Hello. Okay, so um, so this is not a conversation about the European elections and what happened in the European elections. It's more of a chat about how the media can cover the European elections in a way that is relevant. Because a lot of people hear about the European elections and they think, oh my God, this is the most boring thing I have ever heard. <laughs> so, um, closer? Okay. So I'd like to introduce myself. I am Despina Trivoli. I'm a journalist from Athens. And this is uh, Pierre Grange, he's from France. Um, Agnieszka Wisniewska from, from Poland. And Miguel Mora from Spain. Hello. Hello. Um, so Pierre, first of all, is uh, the editor-in-chief of uh, Combini. I'm going to show you a little bit of what Combini looks like, apparently. So this should be showing it, is it? Yeah, okay. So Pierre, do you want to tell us a few things about Combini? What is it like? Um, it's a media for the millennials and designed for the, um, for the social media. So uh, designed especially for Facebook, for Instagram, for Snapchat as well. And we have an internet site that you can see here, but as well it's an internet site designed for the cell phones. So it's always bizarre for me to see it on a on okay. Desktop. So you're used but, to seeing this on, on Instagram or, no, no, or Facebook a, or anything. What sort of media does Combini have usually? No, that's uh, that's our own website, but okay. it's designed to see it on a on a cell phone. Okay. Um, it's you understand the, the the website when you see it on the cell phone. So okay. you, you can use it as well on the desktop, but. It, it's bizarre for me to see it like that. Okay. No. So, and the idea is to, to, to engage people to share the articles, the videos, and the news on the social media. Okay. Uh, and what is the percentage of people going in to read news through mobile? Like 80% or something? Well, well 90%. 90%, like, okay. Something like that. Yeah. Right. And um, Pierre is the editor-in-chief of Combini, and before that he was uh, a reporter at TFI, which is France's premier TV ah, station, Exactly. Yeah. and the deputy editor-in-chief at the News at 8 at TF1. Exactly. Okay. And then um, there is Agnieszka Wifnieszka, right? I got the name right? Okay. And Agnieszka works at a very different media, a legacy media, called Kritishna Politishna. I don't know if I'm saying this correctly. And, and it's a very different, it's completely almost the opposite from what Pierre does. It's like a legacy, intellectual, left-wing magazine that is now a website, right? Yes, we started as a uh, paper intellectual magazine. Uh, we, uh, now we, Kritika Politechna is a network of institutions, a publishing house is an institute, cultural centers, but this is also the daily uh, opinion daily website, Kritika Polityczna, and uh, we are focused on uh, what is happening in, uh, in politics in Poland, abroad, uh, in culture, in economy. We try and uh, we publish, uh, uh, we publish uh, comments and opinions every day, so this is like opinion magazine, but it's, uh, these are not news, these are not short news. These are like the much broader, much, much, much more difficult opinions. And uh, so this, we know we, we are not this kind of mainstream uh, magazine for the mainstream audience. But what is important also for us, we are part of the, uh, the group of uh, the political commentators which are invited uh, regularly to the mainstream media, mainstream television, radio. So, uh, 
on uh, we we are doing the online magazine and then this is the place when we can share opinions but also we can i can do this and uh, all of like our authors and editors we can do this in a public in a mainstream media really mainstream television so almost each day in poland someone from Krytyka polityczna is invited to the to the radio the morning to comment what is happening in politics so are you like a left voice in a conservative environment in a way would you say in Poland, yes, and we are still uh, yes and no. I, I think for younger, uh, for young people, young uh, left wingers, we are like old and liberals, and so <laughs> on. But still, for the mainstream, we are like uh, children, and we are like left wing children all the time. And uh, and we started our work 17 years ago, okay. so we are and, really grown up. And have you been? And how long have you been with uh, Kritishna Politishna? For 10 years. 10 years. Okay. Okay. And then, last but not least, is Miguel Mora, who was Hi. living the dream. He was what younger journalists dream of, because he was an international correspondent in, like, uh, for El País, in uh, Lisbon, Rome, for more than 20 years. Yep, yes, at Paris. Yeah, well. in Paris. And then at some point, he also lived another dream, which is to f do your own. He founded his own media in 2015, yep. ctxt.s. Dot .es, which I'm going to show you. CTXT for context, co context. We couldn't name it context because there is a French magazine called Context, and ah. he threatened to sue to, to, to suit us, so we, we didn't <laughs> do it. But yes, that's, that's more or less the story. I, I never thought I was going out of El País because there was good salaries and, and freedom, but in a certain moment, the crisis arrived, and yeah. like 130 people in the newsroom was was expelled from the from the work. So I protested for that, and uh, I wasn't supposed to protest because I was a correspondent. So they invited me to go, so I went away. And then we found that context though with uh, 13 other people, which was going um, out of the big newspapers in Spain because they. We have the collective um, uh, actions of, of papers putting the, yeah. the, the, the journalists in the, in the streets. So there was about 50% of the, of the Spanish journalists in, in the unemployment in that moment, in 2014. Yeah. So we decided to found a, a different media. We couldn't compete with the daily news and with the big mainstream media so we decided to make like a little new yorker with, ah, a, with, a, with a chorizo flavor you know you, <laughs> like okay, so was that a the spanish model? version of, 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 of the new yorker but very re re reduced we only publish 40 pieces a, a week okay so we do long form and we do uh, only analysis uh, analysis and reportage long long reportage long interviews as agnieszka does in in poland and we are not invited to the TV shows because we are too f far um, left. So oh, wow. they don't like they don't like in uh, in Spain now, nowadays uh, in, independent and free voices in journalism because the crisis has developed a system. Uh, I think in France is similar with with of course some some difference, but. Uh, the banks are owning, and the banks and the, the big companies are owning most of the media in Spain. I think that's so, like a common yes, trend. Yes, like a common European and, <laughs> and common global, European global, trend. global trend. I think it's hard. So in that yeah. environment, it's, it's difficult for little, little media to, to survive. But we found that subscription is, is a way of surviving. Okay, so let me take you back to that. So what is interesting about... Um, CTXT is that you guys are a subscription model yeah. and you were founded with a, you did a crowdfunding campaign and then you went into subscriptions and that's like a so all three of you are from very different models mm -hmm. um, in terms of how you yeah we, we began with crowdfunding when before we started and we found 14,000 euros more or less 15 it was the, all the money was for the informatic people because the technical people because the, the, the website was was to be created, and then let the next year we made another one and we uh, we reached like eighty thousand euros, 
and the 14 founders of the magazine decided to work for free ah. for the first two so years. So you funded this from your own pockets, essentially. Yep. Yep. Okay. And it's been going on for four years now? Four years and a half, yes. Okay. We are almost um, um, growing little by little, and we have now like uh, 600, 600, 600,000 readers per month, which read 11 minutes media, so uh, medium. So it's yeah. the highest 11 rate. Minutes. 11 minutes, yes. Okay, in journalism world, 11 <clears throat> minutes is like a unicorn. Uh, yeah, ladies and we gentlemen, suspect they, they nobody fell, reads 11 minutes We suspect nowadays. they fell asleep when yeah. they when they're living, because otherwise we don't understand that. Like you're happy if your engagement is up to two minutes, if you work at a site. We so are, 11 minutes, good, you know. We are on, on, on the clock, not on the click. Okay, good. Right, and so I'd like to take the conversation back to the elections, because this is um, the topic we're going to cover. I'd like to show you three brief videos about the European elections that are like a background story. I think most of you know like what happened at the European elections, but you never know. So let's do this. I think the results of the European elections were not necessarily the ones we did. <laughs> Bella, bella, molto bella, il cambiamento, si sente nell'aria. Okay, so that's an overall, let's say, assessment. But then I'd also like to look into France. Well, our correspondent Hugh Schofield's in Paris for us uh, with a look at the results uh, there in France. Hugh. Yeah, uh, and uh, the big two uh, have come out way ahead of the rest of the pack here. The big two being Emmanuel Macron's party and the winner, um, Marine Le Pen's national rally. In, in, in effect, they were, they were, the real battle was between those two. Uh, the rest of them being left way, way um, in the rear. Uh, and the, the, the victory went to Marine Le Pen's National Rally Party, but only just. She got about 23%, uh, Macron got 22%, and then way, way down, we have the Greens on 13%, and below them, the centre-right on 8%, the centre-left on, on 6%. So when you're talking about the big two parties in Britain doing badly, spare a thought for the big two parties, or the old big two parties in France who've, who've been wiped out, they've got 15% between them. It is, of course, a, a victory for Marine Le Pen, and she is uh, today uh, in in ju jubilant mode, but it is not a wipeout by any means for, for Emmanuel Macron, and he can draw a lot of solace from the result because it does tend to confirm his view of European politics, French politics, as being between people like him and people like Marine Le Pen. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, that wasn't probably the best video to show to a French audience, but this is an English <laughs> conversation, so everyone had to understand what this was on about. Um, do you have any comments on uh, the French uh, elections? I mean, were there any surprises? Uh, no, but I think he said everything, probably yeah. because he's not French. So, <laughs> he's uh, stuttering, uh, having no, said that. It's, it's perfect. No, there's two big winners for sure, yeah. the Macron's party mm -hmm. and the Eurosceptical of Marine Le Pen. Uh, we had two big surprises on, uh, on Sunday. It was yeah. the rise of the Green Party, the ecologist. Mm -hmm. um, that score was very unexpected. Yeah. It was a big surprise. And the collapse, the incredible collapse of the traditional right party. Yeah. Where, and, and the collapse as well, but it, it was not a surprise, but the collapse as well of the traditional socialist party, the left party. It was it's amazing, <laughs> seriously. Was that something that was polling? I mean, were you expecting this? Were journalists expecting this? Not at all. Not for the Green Party yeah. and not for the White Party. It was a it was a surprise, and the polls didn't 
see it at all. So yeah, the, the, that's interesting. They failed on these two parties, you know, the the ecologist and the rise. They didn't see the rise the rise of the ecologist, and they didn't see the collapse of the traditional right party. Okay, that's interesting how polls and statistics work sometimes in elections, and. In Poland, I think you had the ruling party. If you think that you have two big winners with 20 few percent and 20 few percent, in Poland, the uh, winners have 45 percent. Wow. And the uh, second uh, uh, European coalition, they had 38 percent. This is two wow. big winners. Because like. uh, in most countries, it's a... Um, you know, what you see is like five or six countries going into the European Parliament, even we, with... Yeah, you know. it's, uh, uh, but this is uh, this is uh, uh, th this is because the uh, opposition uh, uh, co build the coalition. So this is a different situation. Ah. This is also some kind of lesson learned by the Polish opposition. Lesson learned from the Hungary, where it's really difficult to uh, to win with the right wingers with Fidesz mm -hmm. because the coalition is splitted. So the Polish coalition, like. Uh, and uh, you were gonna surprise in Polish this European coalition. There are liberals, like conservative liberals, uh, civic platform. There are uh, liberals from some new political party. There are Greens in this coalition. There are post-communist left-wing okay, party. So it's there a like, what? There are uh, the old-fashioned farmers party. So there are everyone. So and they build the coalition. So it's like a, a party for everyone, essentially. And uh, yeah, everything. but we know if something is for everyone, it's like uh, it's not for it's for anyone. That's why it's a, somehow it's a smart idea because if you want to win with a political party which has like 45 percent, like come on, you need to build something really special. So this coalition is uh, the the idea to build this coalition was some kind of. Uh, as I said, this lesson from the Hungary that was the only possibility. It didn't happen, but still, this is like the opposition, this coalition, they had 38 percent. And this, this is, is, and that's it. This is the yeah. end. Like the third party, they had 6 percent, almost doesn't <laughs> exist. So that, uh, so now we, our system looks uh, much more similar to the American one, to the US. Like. Yeah, I think it's interesting because, like, depending on where you're from, um, the amount of European MPs that countries elect is very different. So, for example, I'm from a very tiny country. Greece only elects 21 Euro MPs, while you guys are 70, 79, I think, Francis, or 75, and Poland's 52. 52. 52. So, like, for us, for in Greece, for example, like, I think almost five parties made it to the European. Like, it's a very shattered... So it's interesting to see how different parties do. Yeah, but po Poland invented a new type of bipartisan system. Yeah. The far right and all the rest. Yeah, so it's, oh, okay. it's interesting, yeah. So it's, it's a very conservative environment to, to be doing what you're doing, essentially. So this is a video on Poland on the next day of the election that I want to show you. Bardzo jestem zadowolony z tych wyborów. Popieram politykę tego rządu i chcę, żebyśmy w Parlamencie Europejskim mieli własne zdania. Ponieważ duża grupa ludzi, która była przez lata też ignorowana, jeżeli chodzi o swoje potrzeby, czy to emeryci, czy to ludzie biedni z niskimi dochodami, oni od tego PiSu coś dostali. Europa i Polska potrzebują zmiany i no nie wiem, moim zdaniem to nie, jest, to nie jest dobre rozwiązanie i trochę się tym martwię, ale próbuję zostać, pozostać optymistyczna. i Najlepiej jest, kiedy jednak i prawica i lewica są jakoś pomieszane, bo wtedy jest się w stanie utrzymać jakiś taki porządek, a jeżeli zaczyna się robić jakaś skrajność, to nigdy to nie jest dobre, tak uważam. Ok, so what do you think about this? No one talked about Europe, almost, like at the beginning. Yeah, no, you're right. And that's like, that's actually, I think maybe that's like a, a very similar to, to a lot of countries where the, the European elections are like almost, you know, a prelude to the national elections because they're like almost a test to see how politicians are going to do. I mean, in Greece, we now, uh, you know, the results were so staggering that we now have a snap national election on the 7th of July. So it's always a test at least in some countries, I don't know if it's the same in France or Spain, for politicians to see how they're going to do in national elections. 
And this is also very interesting when we talk, uh, when we mentioned about how many people went to this election. Yeah, so this is, so uh, I, I don't know if everyone can see this. This is the voting turnout. Um, this was, people thought this was going to be like a zero turnout, but this was actually more people went to vote since 1978 in these European elections. It was like a record turnout. And it's interesting to see how different countries have done in this. Um, so um, Spain, which also had national elections on that day, was 64%. Greece also had municipal elections, is 57%. France, 50%. And Poland is 43%. 43 and uh, it's and it grows from 25 and so uh, the last european elections it was, it was 25. 25 yes and it was the biggest ever okay. so uh, what on one hand you could say that uh, you see people are interested in what is happening in european union that they went to election but on yeah. the other hand like we know that's not true like they went because yeah. of the uh, local politics national politics so uh, I think it's the same in other countries, like uh, during the campaign, honestly, we didn't have like lots of discussion about what is happening in European Parliament. It was important because the ruling party is not very respected in uh, European Parliament. Uh, Fidesz is less respected, but like, but it's, uh, it's not, it's not, and, 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 yeah, it's not good, but it's a, uh, so opposition uh, repeated that, you know, we lost our, uh, our position in Europe and we need to okay, get back so, our position. So but it's a national thing only, in Poland. Yeah. What about, if, yeah. sorry. In sorry, Spain, we are, Spain? we are like a, Does stra Spain a, care about? a strange thing. No, we don't care very much, but there were lo local and uh, um, regional elections the same day. Yeah. So it reached 64, which was the same than in the local election. Yeah. So, we have three three boxes to vote, so we vote for in, in the three of them, and we we are a bit different because we have a socialist party which which is winning again. So that's yeah. only in Portugal and is also, happening, or also in in Austria. But and also, what about Vox? This is the first time Vox. And we have for the first time the, the far right as well. The, so the far the right Vox has party. How many? Was it three they, they or took, six? I don't three, remember. They took three, three. Okay, so it's the first seats. time that. So Spain the, has elected the far right party yes, in the European Parliament. Yes, for the Parliament. first time. Yes. Okay. And in the local elections, they 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 didn't take good results, but they took results which allowed them to perhaps decide who is going to be the major in Madrid, and the, and in the also in the region of Madrid. So, the, not not in quantity, but in quality, they are going to be decisive. And in a way, it's uh, the, the election was. A continuation of the general election we, we have month, the, the, the month before how many so what was it last month that you had spain had general elections okay, yes. yes won by the socialist party which hasn't created a government yet but he ah, will, okay he probably do in the next weeks so the socialists took 20 seats from 14 the, the day before the, the time before the corrupted uh, conservative party took 12 from 17, um, the, the, the left of Podemos took eight seats, and uh, no, the liberals, sorry, the, the liberals, the friends of Macron, who are, by the way, doing governments with the far right in, in Spain, and this is going oh, to be wow. a problem, and, and then the, the far left took five seats from eight the, the time before. So we are seeing that uh, some interesting things. Um, the, the vote for, for the eurosceptical parties was very little because all of them are, are pro-euro, but uh, yeah. only, only Vox is not. And then uh, the socialists are, are winning elections for the first time since 2004 and with the same candidate, uh, Borrell who is told to be the, one of the candidates for being the president, of, the president of the parliament, the European parliament. Anyway, the, the, we are better than in Italy or, or France or the UK, that's for sure, and Poland as well, uh, in the sense that the far right hasn't arrived yet to, to gain power in the institutions, but uh, the, the worrying thing is they are uh, that the, 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 the conservatives and the liberals are willing to 
make alliances with the, with the far right. So Macron has told Rivera, which is the liberal leader in Spain, that she that he should be quiet with that. And uh, there is also Manuel Valls, who you know very well here, which was elected in Barcelona uh, and is now trying to avoid that a nationalist party took the, took the power in Barcelona. So, it, so it's, it's a beautiful combination of things. So, I mean, I think the far right is kind of the elephant in the room when it comes to European elections because everyone was very scared of what was going to happen in these elections and whether the far right was going to be, you know, a winner in every single country. And in a, in a way, it's made some gains in quite a lot of countries, but I don't think it's made the, the resounding success that perhaps people were expecting. But, I mean, what about France? I'm curious. Yeah, it probably explains the, the turnout, the big turnout. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of people wanted the Eurosceptic Euro and the far yeah. right to win, so they, they didn't go. They, they, they went to they vote. They went to vote. Yeah. And on the contrary, on the other side, a lot of people didn't want them to be the first party in France. Ah, so they went so to vote. So they went to vote as well. So you can, we can explain, you know, the, the mm. turnout like that. And I mean, there's two more things that um, are coming out as trends, and this is the Greens. And Spain and Poland and Greece have not, you know, the Greens have still not made it, but in France they have. And I mean, what is the, what is the electorate of the Greens? Do young people vote for them? What's the story with the Greens in France? Yeah, it became for the first time the first party with the, for the young people. Um, so it, that, that was a surprise. Yeah. And um, the party changed a little bit. The, the Green Party changed a little bit. It was, it was seen sometimes as a leftish party and it's no longer the case. So they are very focused on ecology. And, okay. um, and, 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 and less on social issues. I mean, moving on to um, the moving on to the media coverage and how the media covered the European elections. I mean, all three of you are from very different media, um, but I was wondering, the Greens, for example, you Combini is a very you know millennial site. It's for young people. It's like 90% on mobile, as you said. So what sort of story, like, do stories on the Greens, for example, make, do they do well? Uh, is that the way to approach young people to be interested in the elections? How, how do you go about that? Um, I would say we didn't really follow the campaign itself. Okay. Because the campaign was not that interesting in, in France, actually, at that time. Uh, but we made a lot of story about what happened the last five years uh, in the European Parliament. What, what, is, um, what, has be, what has been decided? What did they do? And, um, and we followed all, all the, the, the star, the, the pop culture, that the, the, the people from the pop culture that the people who write, who read us know. We follow that people. All of them were engaged in the European election, and the other artists who made some pictures of them fan voting and, and encouraging people to vote. We followed those people. Uh, okay, so you wanted to, you followed the people that were in that you know, in a pop culture way. Exactly. Okay, and was that like how successful was that? I don't know. Maybe <laughs> maybe we are not the only one responsible for the turnout. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, no. But for example, we made a, a special report on snapshots. For example, okay. where we are very powerful, and we did, we did that as well on Instagram, and and we shared all the the picture of the artists who want to to engage themselves on the for all the pro Europe artists. We shared all that all of that um, culture. Um. I, w I was just wondering, were you all in your coverage pro-Europe? Did, did you think that was your coverage aimed towards engaging people to vote? No, not no? really. No, we are very critic with, with, with Europe. We, we are not Eurosceptic, but we are very critical with the politics that Europe has made in the last years to, uh, to cover the, the recession, to I mean, the austerity has has may, have made that many people yeah. uh, has left many people behind, and they are they are not aware of of the 
of, uh, that that has caused the arising of the of the far right in all in all Europe. I mean that that is the principal cause of of the arising of the far right. So if they don't change the politics, it's very difficult to people to engage with Europe. So we tend to make a coverage of Europe, putting the, the, the focus on the economic uh, inequality that has been caused yeah. by the German receipts for the crisis, and on the refugees issue as well, trying to explain that refugees are not the, the danger that the, the, the danger that the danger is the economic uh, policies that that are, are doing are, are leaving people behind and on, on the other hand we are trying to explain that yeah, it's very difficult if, if, if we don't get unite it's very difficult to fight against china and the united states in a in a global market so uh, we need to change Europe to 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 be proud of it. We're going to be proud of Europe that is leaving yeah. people behind, yeah. and that is not fighting for the people working works, and that is is and that, it, that is left in leaving the welfare state behind. So if we have a neoliberal Europe and uh, and a neoliberal approach to policies in in Europe, is is going to be very difficult to. Uh, to fight against the far right and to convince people to go and vote and to convince people to go and defend the European project. So that's the main goal of our coverage on that. And, yeah. and really, because we are living this national uh, feeling again, it's difficult to readers to read on that because they prefer to read on the national issues because they are kind of depressed with the with the things that are being coming from Europe so yeah. it's like a non solutionable issue if uh, you have a very poor Europe in 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 the in the fight for human rights and for worker rights it's difficult to readers to get interested in that so you 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 have a you, you do a coverage a critical coverage and the readers don't, don't, don't mind very much I think it's a I think it's always a fine balance as a journalist on the one hand you want to encourage people to vote and especially if you believe in you know the values let's say of Europe but on the other hand I think especially in Mediterranean countries austerity has really taken a toll in people's belief in Europe um, you know uh, coming from a country that is that was super pro European all of a sudden within the crisis the cracks began to show and then a lot of people, I think, turned to the far right because of that. Um, all of a sudden, they felt that Europe was, um, you know, that it, it represented the face of austerity. And also, a lot of people felt that Europe was lacking in democracy, in, uh, that there was a gap, let's say, in democratic ideals. They, a lot of people don't understand what European Parliament does. Like, they don't know what they do. You're right. So sorry, Agnieszka. Just one word. Uh, Barufaki show us how was the euro was 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 working. It, there was no agenda. There was no records. There was no registration of anything. There, there was like an uh, an invisible institution deciding the future of millions of people. Yeah. So I think that helped very much to 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 understand how Europe is working. But what is the way to show? I think that's the problem. How do you show readers what Europe does? Like, how do you explain Strasbourg and Brussels? What is the way? Do you guys have any suggestions as to how to go about that? I would love to have all of these suggestions and answers. <laughs> and honestly, uh, no, I have to say it honestly that uh, before this election, we decided to uh, to give a floor to the politicians. So we invited them. Ah. We did uh, lots of interviews with the politicians, even with the ruling uh, the, the, someone from the ruling party. But it was only one interview. Much more space we gave to the politicians from the left wing and the uh, progressive uh, political parties. They are not. They will not going to be in the European Parliament. But we thought, okay, like in a mainstream media, or we have. Uh, governmental, like the public media, which are governmental media now, and the uh, mainstream uh, uh, private media, which are anti-governmental. So the left wing, they, they, they don't have a space. Uh, the left wing progressive, they don't have a space in the media. So we thought, okay, like, 
let's give them a space but also uh we are uh, we run the magazine also we can we will going to ask them and we always do this we're going to ask this difficult questions and we will not like we're going to uh i know we went uh, uh through uh, for a few days with one of the political party in this campaign so, bus you know to okay. report this and we thought uh, yeah let's uh, let's show uh, and uh, it was it, this is this paradox when we, we discuss a lot about the political situation but on the other hand we run media we want to inform people or we want to help people to understand what is happening and uh, so i have to be like the honest with my audience like i i you know i uh, I'm a left wing. I, we run the left wing progressive magazine. But on the other hand, I need to be honest that, uh, yeah, but maybe we also need to stop this right wingers. Maybe we need to do this in a coalition. There is lots of questions. We had lots of discussions, like very, very long discussions in our like team. We uh, before the, the two days before the election, we could we could say that. You know, there are like the left wingers, uh, there, there is left wing list, there is progressives, there are greens in these coalitions, even if they are teeny tiny and really weak, they are there. So for the left winger, left wingers, wow, you can choose like from three lists. But honestly, like, let's be honest, like, it's like you can lost your vote, maybe vote. So it's a... Uh, and we, on Sunday evening, we organized, Kritika Politician organized the election evening. You know, three hours event, like live, uh, when, we comment, when we talked about the European Parliament election, when we comment first results, uh, and like so many people came to the... To was this live. open to your audience? Yeah, it was okay. open to the audience. People came, it was live streamed. And, uh, and one hour, like when... Two hours before closing the 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 the, 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 the voting time, we knew, like, because you know we have a friends in media. They told us, and we were like, oh my god! And there was like you know uh, it was nine o'clock, and someone had to read it. And I gave the piece of paper with the results to my friend, and they were looking at this, looking, and I had to. It was so difficult because. This is this kind of, uh, I, I mentioned this because this is this kind of uh, clash, this kind of, uh, you know, the, the moment when on one hand you want to inform people, you, you run medium, but on the other hand, yeah, we, we also have some opinions. Like I, I looked at this results and I was really sad. Like, and I couldn't like, uh, and I couldn't do the smile like in the television. So like, and now I will gonna read the results and uh, <laughs> No, I couldn't do this. Like I was looking at this, and I uh, and people could see that. Yeah, I'm sad. But I think you know, obviously, you're in the unique position in that you're running like a you're like a, a small Gallic village. Do you know what I mean? Like you're you have like a uh, an intellectual left wing media in a very conservative right wing country. So that that has its it's a particular situation. Um, but th does your audience care about the European elections? I mean. What were, the, what were the stories that did well? Did those interviews do well, honestly? Quite well, I, th okay. I have to say. Like, quite well, and uh, there was uh, good... Uh, I, I could see that uh, we had a really big audience one week before elections. And, yeah. and it, was co it was connected with the election. Because I, I follow you know, readership, probably you also do this every day. And uh, I could see that, you know, the grown up in the last week, like people were looking for the information. They were reading like this interviews. And one week after the, like this week after election, people also want to understand what happened. And so they are, they are, they are interested in this, but they are also, uh, they talk a lot about politics. Uh, we have a meeting with our audience, so uh, we also can see this. And, uh, and uh, so they, uh, they really want to understand, they're really involved in this. But even this audience doesn't talk, uh, they don't talk a lot about European Parliament. I have to be honest, they talk a lot about situation in Poland. And we will gonna have national election in autumn. Okay. So this election is like, you know, first part of the game. It was like a test for that. Now in, in, in CTXT we did a special coverage as well, but I, I have to say that as we have had the general elections and the, and the local elections ah. the same day, it wasn't relevant. But what is relevant is 
for example, when, when the Greek crisis happened, we had a lot of readers, because we have a correspondent in Athens, and, and their, the coverage was hugely um, read, read by, by our readers. In, and in Twitter, people were sharing the pieces and everything, because people was seeing, were seeing that a, a criminal act was, was being made with, with Greece. So people cared about that. People cared about that. So when there is uh, something to tell and, and a good, good stories to tell, people will read them, of course. Which is more difficult is to read things about, um, for, for instance, we also had an, an editorial article very uh, shared when the day that uh, Brussels signed the agreement with, Tur with Turkey for the refugees. And the title of that piece was A Shameful Day for Europe. And it was well, uh, uh, very well uh, read. So the, the, the thing is, we, we, we need to find uh, the, the, the focus and, the, and the, um, the, the, the right coverage to, do, to inform about Europe, because it's not easy. I mean, who is doing any more uh, reportage on Greece, on the Greece crisis of refugees? Who is doing that in Europe? Uh, I mean, we, we had some... I don't think many people are doing it in Greece, even. Yeah, but yeah you know nor I mean. in Greece. Because I think... Uh, sorry to interrupt you. I think there is... The news cycle is now so quick and it goes by so fast and there is fatigue on anything. Yeah. So there is like a, a huge wave of sympathy towards the refugees and then that kind of dies down. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, you don't even get people in Greece. Like, yeah, there are people doing it, but the, the interest has really waned. It's, and I think that's... That's the way it works with the news cycle. But of course, like, if you want to cover a story well, you need to keep covering it, as otherwise there's no point. But I, don't th I think the audience is, gets tired, and I, I get why they get tired. We live yeah. in a really fast same news happens, environment. Same happens with Brexit. We have published lots <laughs> of pieces about Brexit, but people doesn't care anymore because I mean uh, it's it's well, who knows what will, what will happen there. I mean you you know you know but May has has resigned because because of that. So in a way, Europe is is, is deciding many things in our lives, and we are not keeping attention to that. No, so it's it's extraordinary that that this happens. I don't think the you know like I think even British people are fed up with Brexit. They don't even know what to make of it. Yeah. No, seriously. I mean it's. Every day is something new for them. So I guess it's one of those things that has dragged on for so long. And, but I think at the same time, it's, it's, it's showing an image of Europe that we weren't expecting to see in a way. Yeah. I don't think any of us growing up thought that one day we would see, you know, Britain leaving the European Union. It's like, a, I think it was a huge shock for Europe. I don't know if um, the readers of Combini, for example, who are young and hip and youthful, do they care about like Brexit or any of that stuff? Do you get audiences when you write stories like that? No, they care like the uh, all the audience. They care as well when there is a, a huge a new information. Okay. But on a daily basis, I think they are they are fed up as well, like everyone, you know, because they heard too much probably about it. But it is the the same case for the migrants, for Brexit, but even uh, uh, for Trump or Venezuela or something like that, yeah. you know, they don't want to hear about it every day. So our challenge is to speak about new information about the decision for Br Brussels, but not always the same thing. That's our challenge. And I'm, I'm not sure to succeed. Yeah. <laughs> and how would you... Yeah, that is a challenge. It's very, it's, it's very challenging, I think, to make people interested in European politics that are not national in a way, as you said before. People always see... European politics as an extension of their state, and that kind of makes sense. But, but also, like, uh, I, honestly, I understand this. Like, it's uh, on one hand, uh, um, I tell this because uh, I, sometimes I really hate this kind of discussions when we think, yeah, we should cover the like the stories. Like, we need to explain this. Like, no, uh, we need to write this long reportage and uh, or we need to explain how to do how to explain i understand how to explain how the european union works and all of this this is so difficult oh my god so and then you are looking for like catchy title and catchy picture like yeah. maybe people will gonna click and maybe they will gonna read like just a sh short part and uh 
people, if they are interested in European Union and in Europe, they are interested because of their own life, because of what have changed. Yeah, right. And, uh, you know, I, when I was born, like, Poland had as a border with, uh, uh, with Soviet Union. Like, you know, uh, when I was in high school, Poland was not in European Union. So it's, uh, uh, it's like, uh, it's, if, even if in my life, every, uh, each of this is really new, like all of these changings happens. And uh, so when people think about European Union, very often they can think, okay, uh, uh, they can think about uh, we can travel, they can think about uh, how, in example, in Poland, you can really see how the middle uh, cities like uh, have changed, how the cities have changed. They really like, we really build it lots of roads from the money from European Union. On each sidewalk, you have like huge sign founded by European Union. It's the like same in my in village, Greece. there is no road, but there is a sidewalk founded by European Union. <laughs> it's like, I think, uh, I think it's the easiest uh, money to organize for the sidewalks because they are everywhere. <laughs> and, no. uh, but that it really changed the, the people's life. And, uh, and this is also something that, uh, Somehow, uh, if, like in, uh, th this, also changed people's life because people could see, like, okay, so we can have the sidewalk, we can have this and that, and we uh, we can expect more. And uh, in Poland, uh, the right wingers gave them more. Liberals repeated them, like, uh, if you want to live in a different way, like, take a loan, change the change the job, like, you know, the, all this liberal bullshit. And the right wingers came and they built, they gave them. Uh, some social programs. And so it's uh, because they understood that people expect more also because how Poland have changed because we are in European Union. It's, uh, so somehow you can see how that this, this European Union is a part of your everyday life. And, uh, but you don't think uh, about this bureaucracy because it's, uh, and I understand, this is very difficult, just, this is very difficult. Yeah. But it's, uh, so maybe it's uh, possible to explain how European Union, how, how Europe can work. And, uh, but uh, I can see uh, how many mistakes, even in the media, we can do. Like in a liberal media, uh, for all the campaign, uh, and uh, I'm in, a, in a, the, one of the biggest online, uh, the, the biggest uh, the, the daily information TV channels, like uh, once a week. And each time when they talk about European Union, there is like huge numbers, like uh, how much money we have from European Union. And that's all. Like the European Union is a huge, like the pocket, like with the money. Like, yeah, it's, it's like a, a, someone giving you money all the time, but you don't really get how they work or what they do. They just... They so work like you. parents when you are a small child, they have a money. It's like, and sometimes they can say, you, oh, no, no, you cannot change your, this system or you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, change the uh, judiciary system or something like, you know, or this, some this or that. I think some crazy stuff sometimes. Uh, these stories do really well, actually, the stories about the European Union not allowing you your traditional unpasteurized cheese or stories about the European Union not allowing you to eat like lamb's intestines, like those, these are like real stories. And people like really like these stories for some reason, like the European Union is like a bad uncle that's not like, that's giving them money, but not allowing them to kind of, you know, eat their unpasteurized cheese. But um, I was like, Poland is, is one thing, but I was wondering whether people in, I mean, France or Spain are two enormous countries, then they're like, you know, the found, like they're the founding fathers, essentially, of the European Union. And I was wondering whether people are more blasé towards the European Union than, let's say, people are in Poland. Do they, do they view the European Union as some sort of archaic institution? Are they interested in it? Uh, is there a, how much is Euroscepticism a thing, essentially, um, for French young people? Um, I don't know how to answer that for the young people, but mm. you know, one thing very interesting is that Marine Le Pen, so the Eurosceptic party, they don't ask any more friends to leave the European unions. Ah, they okay. Mind about that. And they don't want even French to leave the, the euro, the currency. So, you know, they are, that's, that's, a, that's interesting. That's, that's a, very that's, critical, yeah. of course. 
they want to change a lot of, um, of policy inside the, the European Union, but they don't want any more friends to leave the, the, the euro. So we don't have that, that huge movement. Maybe, maybe it's after the, the Brexit and the shock after the Brexit. Yeah. Maybe it's because of that. Maybe. But we don't have that movement in France, not a, not a large one as well, who wants to leave the, U, the EU. Yeah, we, we in Spain, we have three out of four citizens love uh, the European Union. Oh, wow, okay. So, and the, the young people in Spain are the, 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 the country in Europe that most uses the Erasmus uh, trips. So we have a tradition on that, and, and, and we love being part of Europe, and we're, we are convinced of, of that. We entered in 1986, and we modernized the country with the structural funds from, from Europe. So everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. And in fact, when the structural funds ended, we began, we began our huge crisis in, in Spain. So it's very interesting because I saw a study by a German think tank called CEP some weeks ago, which was saying that the euro, it was worse for Italy and France than for everybody else. So that it costed like 4.5 billion uh, euros to France and 4.1 billion to Italy. Meanwhile, uh, Germany, it was uh, better in, in, one, in one billion, and Spain was more, more, or less, more or less the same with the euro. So we don't, we don't discuss that. And what we, what we try to do in, in, in the magazine is to try to explain the, the, the problems, no? that try, to, to, try to understand the commercial treaties which are very dark and obscure and, and need, needed to be explained, but it's, it's a huge uh, task to explain that. I mean, it's so difficult and, and, and people usually don't, don't read like, things like that. But as well, it is the, the easiest thing to, to catch readers talking about the far right. If you talk about Nigel Farage or you talk about the Kaczynskis or Viktor Orban, people will read that. I mean, they, because I think, not, not because they like it, but because they fear it. So, I mean, we have to be very pedagogic on that. I mean, we have to write a lot on that. We have to try to explain why countries like Hungary or Poland are, are doing that, that sort of thing, are, are, are under that sort of regime. And that will help uh, others not to fall on that. No, I mean, I mean the only thing we can do is being, being uh, thoughtful and true and critic with, with, with that and, and to is, try, to is, try, try to explain it well. I think, you know, even if essentially I think you, it's a fine line between being, you know, you, you are pro, as I said before, you are pro-Europe, you want people to vote, you believe in that Europe is the best alternative, but at the same time you're a journalist, you have to cover the good and the bad of, you know, and I think the more honest you are with the audience about the reality of what is going on in Europe, the more they, you know, they will appreciate it. Um, sorry, you were meaning to say? Well, the, the mainstream media usually is, has a European uh, vocation. No? They, yeah. they, are, they are okay with the, with the commercial treaties, they are okay with the corporations, with the lobbies, corporations yeah. that 2,000 lobby people working in Brussels nowadays. So that things, if you don't read the alternative press, you don't read it at all, because the mainstream media won't, won't, tell, it, won't tell you. So I think it's very important, and this is a publicity second, that yeah. readers subscribe and, uh, and give support to alternative media, because the mainstream narrative won't, won't tell us the truth about what is really happening there. So there are lots of things happening in Brussels. The problem is little journal, little newspaper cannot afford to have a correspondent in Brussels or two correspondents. So it's difficult for us to, to get good information on that. So you have, you have to rely on experts. And this is the academic part of 
política <laughs> and contexto. So we, we tend to publish lots of things from, from academics as well. We try to, to we publish Piketty, as you do, uh, the, the Economist of Social Europe and, and things like that, which are difficult for a, for a bigger audience as well, because they are technical and they are very academic. But you have to do it, because if you, if you, if you don't publish that sort of things, that you, don't, you, don't, you cannot tell the, the truth. Yeah, it's, uh, but I do this every day, so I really believe that it has sense. But there are some moments when I think, oh my God, we were going to explain everything, but uh, is it we're going to change something? Uh, you mentioned Piketty. So uh, there, is, there is a video from the meeting with Jarosław Kaczyński, the leader of uh, Law and Justice ruling party. And Jarosław Kaczyński at the uh, meeting with the audience said, there is a very good book by Piketty, unfortunately published by Krytyka Polityczna. So he read it. And uh, somehow it's sad for me because he read it and he understood what is happening about inequalities. And the liberals, they didn't read it. And they failed. <laughs> it's, uh, so uh, this is also somehow... Uh, I, I, I want to explain uh, what is happening. I, uh, I also try to find, uh, also in Kritika Politicna, we try to find like, you know, some kind of uh, new way how to do this. Yeah. Uh, this is difficult and, um, and um, but because, yeah, we are this kind of opinion daily, like long read um, articles magazine, but it's, uh, but uh, still, we believe that uh, e we we can help to like to uh, to understand what is happening, and but there are this moment when I think, uh, but who who uh, who can be our audience and who can really understand what is happening? And it's uh, and this is the um, uh, that's why I mentioned this the, this Kaczyński. Uh, because, uh, you know, the Polish Prime Minister uh, Morawiecki, he wrote the preface to Matsukato's books. They really, they, they read all of these uh, progressive uh, books about economy, the, the far right. So they are... But, you know, like, the far right is very, you know, they, they always provide very kind of easy sound bites and easy solutions. And it's kind of why people turn to the far right sometimes. Yeah, but to build this is like, you know, the, we can say, yeah, they, they gave an easy solution. But to find out this easy solution, Kaczynski read the Piketty. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> and how many, how many books did you sell after Kaczynski advertisement? Did that, did that help with your sales? A bit. It always helps, like when there is a, when there is a, some kind of controversy. Last controversy we had, we published a book about the snail, book for children. About the snail, you know, snail is not a boy and not a girl, hermaphrodite. Okay. There was such a scandal in Poland. We sell lots of copies of this book. Main TV, like main information uh, programs on the public television or the private television talk about this. Wow. And that's, uh, so some, uh, this is also when I think how to talk about these difficult issues. Sometimes we try to find, uh, you know, some kind of good story, like the book, yeah. book for children and so on. And uh, I think, yeah, we need to try to explain this, but also we, uh, what is, uh, what I also think about, what is important for me, also how to uh, be listened by the audience I want to be listened, like how to, how to, uh, I would like this, uh, this articles and these books we publish will be read by the, I don't know, politicians maybe, by the this liberals who, they, they really think that we were going to build a coalition. We don't need a program because our program is we want to win with Kaczynski. Yes, it's enough for 38%, but they have 45 now. So, and uh, so this is also the, you know, the, this, uh, this, uh, some kind of uh, thinking about the uh, audience and the thinking about this kind of clashes uh, we mentioned between uh, our our work and between politics, between yeah. something we do and uh, between uh, like this this kind of relation with our audience, like uh, what we do and how we can uh, because we want to influence politics, like let. Some, we want to influence politics in a meaning. We want to change something in the world, like, you know. Yeah. 
I think your passion is kind of infectious because all of a sudden, the way you speak about stuff is kind of inspiring for us in, in a way that, you know, you all, I, I think as a journalist, you always want people to, you want to make, you know, you want people to read what you're writing. Nobody writes or does TV for his mom. Do you know what I mean? You always want to, for what you do to, you know, to have an influence. And it's great to see that, you know, you're so passionate about this. Um, especially considering, you know, the, uh, the particular situation in Poland right now. Um, I think I would like to wrap this up be and leave the audience to ask us any questions if they have any. Okay, I can. <laughs> um, so, do you guys have a... Okay. Oops. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does, does it work? work? Does it work? It no? Yes? Yes, I, th I think we can hear Okay, you. so um, I'm coming from Austria. We have ah. an interesting situation where six minutes of video showing the right-wingers entrapped ah. in a situation, but basically have, forcing them to resign, bringing down the, the conservative right-wing government. Now, just today, a first female prime minister in Austria. So it really, six minutes of um, entrapment video, not necessarily of journalists done, but published by by German journalists and two, three um, media organizations brought down a right-wing government. Yeah. It, brought, it, it showed the corruption really in your face, the unpatriotic, absolutely incredible corruption of the right-wing. So as a journalistic st strategy, I wanted to ask you if, if you, do you consider like uh, this kind of strategy to really entrap or to make secret video recordings or to go into this into this length to really show the true face of the right wingers, which mostly are corrupt. Just in Italy today, uh, some um, uh, support of uh, of Salvini has been also jail put uh, you know sentenced for jail. So yeah, is there a need for more investigative, more secret recordings of? of courageous journalists bringing down these right-wing uh, minions. I think, th I think this is what journalists should do. And uh, I know it didn't change the situation. And uh, we, we had similar situation in Poland. There is audio recorded, uh, the, the, some conversation with, by Kaczynski, and it didn't change. So on one hand, you can say, like, that this is not the Watergate. Yeah, I know. But it's uh, but but you need to do this. What is the problem? Uh, I think right now it's uh, it's uh, that uh, media are splitted, some kind of similar uh, as a political scene is splitted. So politicians they talk to the they to the audience and the media some they talk to the audience like you know liberal media talk to the liberal media like the uh, in. A, I think it happened very often that uh, you know, we are in a specific situation because we build it our audience and we really talk to especially our own audience. But this is the problem that uh, uh, in a situation when you have some, this kind of material, you will gonna publish this like, yeah. in a newspaper and television, but it will gonna go, like who will gonna read this? Who will gonna listen to this story? I think, <laughs> I think entrapment is, I mean, if, you dis if as a journalist you decide to entrap someone, that should be like the absolute last resort that you have as a journalist. It's not like something to be done lightly, I think. You have to be very careful when you do that. I mean, in that case, um, I, th I just think you need to be super careful when taping people with a camera because nowadays, within three seconds, you know, you can ruin someone's life, obviously. So you have to be super extra careful. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm a bit, yeah, so I'm a bit, you know, skeptical about jumping on this bandwagon very easily of saying, oh, let's do this. But, uh, but also it's, sometimes you've got material like this in your hands, but it's very hard to publish it, essentially, as a journalist, because it's, it's, you're not, like, the situation is shut that you're, it's not easily done. If you know what I mean. Sometimes economical situation, like also doesn't help you in because uh, you know media. I ca I couldn't publish this kind of material in on my website because when uh, I don't know when some politicians go to the court with me, I will gonna lost and I then I will not gonna have the money to like to for this kind of case. Also, it it really. 
to answer your question, the legal framework uh, for media in each country and what they publish is very, very different. Um, I don't know what the legal framework is like in every single one's country. Like Greece, for example, has a very strict framework in terms of what you publish. You can get sued very, very easily. You're not even, not even your sources are protected, essentially. So you have to be super careful. What well, the, the thing about that Austrian thing is probably is made by the German service, secret service. No. You think it's made by the journalists? Austrian services. Well, it's difficult to set up a Russian oligarch and his... Uh, his <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it costs a lot of money. I mean, there is no, no newspaper in Europe that can pay for that, I guess. <laughs> you need yeah. to... No, you need, you need, no, not really. I mean, investigative journalists is not setting traps to people. It's, it's a different thing. And we don't, we don't have even the money to, to make investigation. Most, of, most, most of us thing. in Europe is the most expensive thing to do. Yeah. So it's, I mean, I, I don't know what I, I would do if I get that material. I probably would, would have published it, yeah. but I cannot make it uh, out. I mean, I, I, I cannot invent it. And, and yeah. the ontology doesn't allow us to do things like that. We can publish it if it's, if it's on, in, on public interest. And indeed it was. Indeed it was. Yeah. And it's that, always a that question why of public interest, I think, in these things, isn't it? That, that oh, of course, is with the vice president of the country. You, yeah. uh, you have to publish that. But, and there's, but only the Spiegel or, or the other one can publish, or so Deutsche can, can publish things like that because they are big uh, enterprises that can afford the cost of going to, to court with that, which we cannot. I don't know if Combini can, but critical and, and, and context, we cannot afford that. Yeah. Any other questions from anyone? Yes. Okay. Hello. Um, is uh, European media the future of the of is the European media, the future for your medias. The European, sorry? European medias, consortiums. So I didn't quite catch the question. So what was if, the, can you repeat if, that? If there is any pan-European uh, consortium of media, that would be the future for us ah. to, to associate. That's an interesting question. I don't think there are enough. We are critical. We are we are we are partners. We exchange. Oh, you are. We okay. exchange um, uh, contents. This yes, is what we, we do. We... This is what we do on uh, on our levels. I think it's uh, it's very interesting. I don't know the the, the formal one, but uh, an example: the magazines like us, and also some like with some others. Uh, we have some kind of also informal cooperations when we exchange materials. You know, we can, sometimes we cannot even afford, like uh, for me, uh, for Kritika Politichna, buying the article from Guardian is like, oh my God, like, <laughs> let's be honest. But I can exchange for fee some, some very well, uh, like the good quality materials with uh, some magazines uh, which are on the same scale. And this is a this is a huge for us and for many with uh, with Alan from Czech Republic with many magazines like with Merce from Hungary. Yeah. So this is one thing. And the other, when I think about the, the consortium cooperations, and we mentioned the uh, the investigative journalism, I think it's not also the the coincidence that you remember Panama Papers, yeah, so which were done by the, the some kind of consortium. Yeah, it's called the ICIJ. I think yes. it's the intern. I'm not gonna, I don't remember what it stands for, but all these journalists from different newspapers did the Panama Papers together, for example. Um, so there are things like that. Uh, now with the internet, it's much easier, especially for investigative journalists to work. And sometimes it's the only way to work, especially if you do investigative journalism, because as we mentioned, it is super expensive to be doing these huge, large scale um, investigations. And I think in terms of investigative journalism, there's definitely something going on there and a lot of, it's like a global thing, I think. It's not even yes. pan-European. Yes. Um, and I think the future is definitely in that. I mean, the European Union does have some awards, and, but I don't think there is enough cooperation, no, on like a, 
on an association level. And I think that's because language, there, there is, the language barrier is, is always a, important. Sorry, yeah, no, go. No, there is several network already. Ah, okay. An investigative uh, journalist. Yeah. And, uh, and we share, we're part of one. And uh, no, yeah, we share data, and we share way to work, uh, way to, uh, to make uh, investigation. And uh, yeah, it changes a lot because you and you don't feel you don't feel alone, you know. Yeah, we, uh, no, it's true. So you don't feel it's... alone, and it's easier to to launch uh, all together a, a powerful uh, information. Yeah, there there is one thing I would like to say before we we finish. The, that is very difficult for little newspapers like or magazines like us to find uh, any help in the in the European Union, and and I yeah. guess that's. That's a mistake because I mean they they should uh, help plurality by helping little independent media that are trying to cooperate with other European media. I mean uh, they, there are um, grants for doing uh, cinema, uh, literature, culture, but not for journalism. And and I'm not I'm not asking to be to be. Uh, um, you just I'm, think you, there should there should be a, a little more support. That there should be support for European little European media to get on on collaboration. I mean okay. I mean that 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 should be a goal in the European Union, because I mean the mainstream media doesn't doesn't need any any kind of that, and if they if want to do it they do it privately, yeah. but. Uh, I mean, the, the, the ecosystem of, of the free press should be protected. And they are not protecting it, and they should. Okay. That's an interesting point, actually. And perhaps this conversation will be the first step towards that. <laughs> Who knows? No. Um, so are there any more questions, or should we wrap this up? We wrap it. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank uh, you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much.